Okay. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming to my talk. I appreciate it. it is quite early in the morning, and especially for people who were out sampling the culinary and, I guess, alcoholic delights of Vienna last night. I feel for you. I really do. <laughs> um, I've decided to step down from the podium because when I stand behind the podium, you really just can't see me. I'm too short. But being this size is very, very useful for social engineering because when the security guards come along, I can hide anywhere. I can hide under a desk. <laughs> I've spent hours under desks hiding until people go home from work. And uh, my colleagues regularly threaten to post me into an organization in a box, but I don't know if they would poke uh, air holes in the box or not, so I haven't accepted that one. <laughs> Um, so my name's Sharon Conheedy. Uh, I'm based in London where I work as a social engineer. So I trick people, I manipulate people, I try to bypass security controls and ultimately gain access to sensitive information or sensitive facilities. And I think one of my favourite jobs over the last few years was when a client came to me and said, Sharon, um, we're a bit concerned about how much our employees are talking in the pub. So every Friday, they go to the same local pub after work. We're really, really worried. So we would like to pay you to go and sit in the pub and listen to what all our guys are saying about work. So I said, fantastic, that's a great job. I'm Irish, so it's really, really expensive. <laughs> But the next week, they came back to me and they said, yeah, that was great. We got loads of information back. We were right. Uh, they also frequently go down to the sports club. We're a bit concerned about what they're saying when they're sitting in the sauna or sitting in the jacuzzi. So we'd like you to go down and sit in the jacuzzi and the sauna for the day. <laughs> and I had to draw the line there because no way was I giving them the photos of that particular social engineering engagement. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where social engineering has come from and in particular where social engineering is going in the future. So first of all, the term social engineering uh, has been around for quite a while and it was brought in towards the end of the Industrial Revolution when a Dutch guy realised that in order to run an industrial plant you needed both the mechanical engineers to look after the machines and you needed the social engineers to look after the people side of running an industrial plant. So it's a term from political science that goes back quite some time. So I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of social engineering over the ages. We'll start with social engineering 100 years ago. And uh, I think the turn of the 20th century was the golden era of the con artist. There were so many fraudsters, so many con artists, and they had beautiful, beautiful scams. And many of you will be familiar with the film The Sting, starring Robert Redford. I mean, that was a standard scam that they had going around this time. But this guy here is one of my favourite con artists of all time. His name is Victor Lustig. And this guy managed to sell the Eiffel Tower, not once, not twice, but several times. So it was after the First World War, uh, I think it was about 1925, this guy decided he would represent the French government. And uh, he gathered some scrap metal dealers into a fancy room in the Ritz Hotel in Paris. And he said, look, I'm representing government. And we're running short on funds. We've just paid for a big war. So we're thinking about dismantling the Eiffel Tower and selling it for scrap metal. So he got some pretty good offers. And uh, it happened several times. He, he was successful with this several times because the first couple of times it happened, people were too embarrassed to go to the police. So he got away with it, and he was caught eventually. But really, it was a classic social engineer. It used current events. I mean, every second virus that we get today is related to current events. That's how they get people to open emails in the first place. Uh, there's malicious search engine optimization. So, for, for example, when uh, the news about the Apple iPad re was released, I think the first three or four results actually linked to malware sites. So, you know, it's a similar kind of technique. This guy, Victor Lustig, he impersonated someone in authority. We see that all the time. Um, of course, it was a very, very good deal for buyers. They thought they were getting a bargain, and that technique has worked throughout the ages. And 
again, he, he was able to do this attack, execute the attack again and again. And it still happens today. So uh, this is an English guy, a lorry driver, who was put in prison this summer because he tried to sell the Ritz Hotel in London. And he was pretty close to selling it. <laughs> happens all the time. So uh, 40 to 50 years ago, I'd say the most famous social engineer was this guy. Anyone recognize him? Frank Abagnale. The film Catch Me If You Can was based on him. So Frank Abagnale was a fantastic social engineer. He's a really, really intelligent guy. He did all his research. He sat the bar in California. Uh, he was able to back up any of the roles that he played with loads and loads of information. So he would always play an authoritative role, whether it was a lawyer, a doctor, or as he's probably most famous for, playing an airline pilot. So I was wondering if this would still work today. Most definitely. So uh, in March this year, a Swedish guy <laughs> was arrested because he'd been flying passenger airplanes for 13 years without a license. <laughs> he had the right documents, he looked the part, he had his stripes, and uh, the police went in. He was about to take off. He's sitting in the cockpit. And the police go in to arrest him. And they said the look of relief on his face to be given up the deception after 13 years was just fantastic. It happens all the time. It happened in China. Look it up in the news. You'll get so many examples. So uh, I, I fancied trying this myself. I thought I could try my hand at maybe being an airline pilot or more possible for me, I guess, an air hostess. So Frank Abagnale, in his time, had to go to great lengths to get his airline costume. Anybody who has seen the movie will know that he had to go direct to the manufacturers and social engineer them as well. Well, it's much easier today. You get them on eBay. And eBay actually has a section, transportation, aeronautica, airlines, clothing. And they make it really easy for you. You can look it up according to whichever airline you want to be. <laughs> but I'm warning you, um, these costumes, the air hostess costumes, are really, really expensive. They sell for hundreds of euros, and it beats me who is buying them. <laughs> I really don't know. So I don't have one yet, but I'm getting one one day. Pretty useful. <laughs> So 20 years ago, uh, Kevin Mitnick was the big name in social engineering, and he was the first person who kind of brought the term into IT security. This is his definition. 10 years ago, uh, social engineering started to get really interesting. Uh, we had the love bug virus, which was the first time we received malicious emails from our friends. So because they came in from our friends, why wouldn't we open them? There was no reason not to. We'd never seen malicious emails coming in from our friends. And of course, we had the first phishing attacks, uh, of fishers trying to take over AOL accounts. Some of the major social engineering headlines of 2010. Of course, firstly, early this year, we had uh, the Google CN story. And what was interesting about this is that the attackers didn't target Google staff directly. They identified who Google staff friends were on social networks, and they took over their friends' accounts. Then when they sent a message from the friends' account to the Google staff members, they were far more likely to open it or click on the URL or download the attachment, again, because it came in from a friend. Uh, then we had the Facebook charges. So people got emails saying Facebook was about to start charging for monthly access. And people were really, really angry Facebook has always been free. How dare they start charging $4.99 a month for access? So they objected. Uh, they were able to join groups on Facebook to object to this. They were able to click on dislike. They downloaded malware all around the place. So it was a great social engineer. Anybody recognize this lady? Anybody friends with this lady? Because if you are, start worrying. <laughs> uh, this is... Supposedly, Robin Sage, it was a security project done by Provide Security. Um, they decided to set up a fake profile on social networks for this lady. They set her up a profile on Twitter, on Facebook, on MySpace, on LinkedIn. 
um, and they decided to give her the title of Cyber Threat Analyst. Um, they let the project run for 28 days during which they tried to connect to various security people around the world. And they were pretty successful. In the course of 28 days, they connected to th over 300 security professionals. Uh, they got the photo from an adult website. They thought that this Robin Sage might appeal to many people in the security industry. So over the course of the month, Robin Sage received dinner invitations, job offers, and really, really sensitive information, including troop locations, what time helicopters were taken off. So there were a few clues in Robin Sage's profile that might have made you suspicious if you did any research on her at all. So firstly, if she was trying to connect to you, no way do you know her, she doesn't exist. Robin Sage is actually the name of a military exercise and Robin Sage said she was 25 years old but that she had 10 years professional cyber threat analysis experience. So maybe she, maybe she did, maybe she was some kind of whiz kid, but the chances are. <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, give you some thoughts in the future of social engineering as I see it. First of all, I mean, we, we've seen with the pilot thing, we've seen with selling the Eiffel Tower and selling landmarks. It's the same tricks. It's the same tricks that work over and over in history. We get the same scams, the same cons repeated again and again. It's just they change with technology. So, I mean, t uh, 10, 15 years ago, phishing attacks appeared. Uh, they took place over email. They took place over social networks. Now we've got phishing that uses VoIP technology. We've got smishing that uses SMS. I'm sure we'll get whatever ishing comes next. Uh, but a beautiful example is the advanced fee fraud. So the Nigerian 419 scams that we see so often today actually date back hundreds of years. The first example I could find was about 500 years old and uh, it used to take place in the UK at the, around the time of the Spanish Armada. So they would target a member of the aristocracy. The con artist would find a nobleman, find a beautiful Spanish looking lady, go to the nobleman and say, this beautiful lady's father is imprisoned in Spain and we need some money to bribe the guards to help release him. And if you give us the money, not only will you be reimbursed with hundreds and hundreds of pounds and gold jewels and rubies, but you can also marry this beautiful Spanish lady that I have on my arm. What an offer. <laughs> so lots of people fell for this. They'd give the cash advance. They'd never see the money or the beautiful lady again. So we skip forward to, I think, the 17 or maybe early 1800s. And this guy, Eugène Francois Vidoc, started his life as a criminal, spent years and years in jail, and then interesting, interestingly went on to found the fr French police force as we know it today. Um, so Eugène Francois Vidoc published his memoirs. You can, you can read them on Google or you can buy the book. And he mentioned a scam called the Letter from Jerusalem. And again, it was very, very similar. Uh, they'd target a member of the aristocracy or someone with a lot of money again. They'd write them a letter, give them some reason to advance some cash to them. It might be something as silly as saying, we're the assistant to this aristocrat and he lost a box of jewels. We need to find them somewhere, so we need to pay for searchers. If you give us the money, we'll share the jewels with you. So I like the statistics that Vidoc mentions. He says of 100 letters, 20 were always answered because they were very, very, very targeted attacks. Possibly the first uh, example we saw of spear phishing. And my favorite quote, quote from Vidoc is that sometimes even the Parisians would fall for this scam. So it was very, very serious. So throughout history, again, they've repeated, and we skip forward to the 1980s. That's when these scams first started appearing out of Nigeria. Uh, the oil-based economy was in decline, so some Nigerian students thought maybe they could take advantage of this, and they'd contact uh, usually U.S. businessmen, sending them letters or sending them faxes 
or even telexes saying, we can cut you in on this really good business deal if you just let us have a bit of money in advance. So the same thing over and over. And of course, it eventually turned into email attacks. So this is a typical 419 scam that we see today. Uh, attackers will often try <coughs> to make their victims feel some kind of emotion. Because when we're emotional, whether it's being angry because Facebook are starting to charge for account access, or whether it's because you're feeling upset or sympathetic because this guy's clients all died in, in a, a plane crash. Once you feel that emotion, you're more open to suggestion. So this guy says his bank clients and his entire family died in a plane crash and he needs some money. And actually, if you click through or even type this URL in, it backs up his story. So this mightn't work for people in the security industry, but it could work for a lot of other people. So uh, this is the the Concorde crash that happened in Paris about 10 years ago. And I'm not quite sure why he's referring to a news story that's that old. But today, uh, it's turned into more of a friend scam. And we often receive emails from our friends now saying that they've been stuck abroad. I mean, the first time I received this attack, even I had to think twice about whether it was real or not because I received it from an acquaintance rather than a friend. So I didn't know the lady that well. Uh, I think I'd met her kind of professionally a couple of times, but I didn't know her background. I didn't know that she wasn't in Nigeria. Maybe she could have been in Nigeria. So she says that she, uh, she was on the way to the hotel and she lost her bag. And she now owes a sum of $2,000, but she needs me to help out with a sum of $3,500 urgently. So no way was I handing over that kind of money. But the interesting thing is that with a lot of these uh, friend scams, the amount is often the exact same. You'll see this $2,000 and $3,500 amount repeated over and over. So it's always, you know, it's old attacks reworked. And when the request comes in from your friend, of course you're more likely to comply with it. So they're getting very effective. The latest one, appears to be the London mugging. So this comes in via social networks or via some kind of chat. Your friend will say, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you I was visiting London. But when I was there, I was mugged, lost my bag. I, they, they stole my money, stole my wallet. So I need you to give me some money again to pay for the hotel. I live in London. It's probably quite realistic. But I thought, I was surprised last year when we had the whole volcano thing going on. Everybody was stranded across the world. That was the ideal time for social engineers to take advantage. I mean, can you imagine if you were after a particular organization? Most global organizations had people stranded somewhere because of the volcano. So find who these people are. Offer them a lift, offer them some kind of assistance. There were tons of carpools set up. People disclosed their email addresses, they disclose their telephone numbers. You know, this guy, I'm in Amsterdam and I need to get to Dublin. Can anyone help? He's going to accept a lift with anyone going that way. So I didn't hear of any attacks that use this, but you never know. It was the prime ground for social engineers. So next on social engineering, the attacks are getting a lot more sophisticated and a lot more targeted. So take phishing for an example. Now, we still get those blanket phishing attacks that are sent out to everybody, but we're seeing more and more spear phishing attacks that are very, very targeted. This was an example of an email that executives in big companies in the US received last year. So uh, it was a subpoena telling them they needed to appear in court the following week or the following month. Now, first of all, you get this email, you're going to be kind of worried. Do you need to appear in court? It looks pretty professional. It's a long way from the early phishing attacks. It looks really, really good. It's issued to an individual. It isn't sent to groups and groups of people. It's issued to particular individuals. So I think this is a very effective attack. Uh, another example we have that uh, I think dated from last year or early this year, um, was quite effective because 
the fraudsters identify the names of vendors that dealt with particular companies and then they emailed them. They didn't have malicious URLs in the email. They didn't have suspicious attachments. Uh, they actually asked them directly to open up particular ports on the firewall or to accept uh, particular IPs into their company. So it's a really good attack. And the reason it's good is because the sender knows a lot of information. So they knew the vendor name. They knew the name of the IT administrator. And in certain cases, they knew the name of the project that the IT team was working on. So you can see that was a whole combination of social engineering attacks that must have taken place before they sent this email. Very effective. But of course, the bait is not always going to be online. It could be in the real world. It could be a road apple in the real world. Maybe USB keys scattered around the car park. Maybe nothing to do with IT at all. There's a really good example of attackers uh, leaving parking tickets on some cars in the US. And when the people came back, they saw they had parking tickets and they were instructed to visit a certain URL to identify the photo of their car, click on it, <laughs> and pay their fine. Of course, what do you think happened when they clicked on it? They downloaded all kinds of lovely malware to their machines. But because it had absolutely nothing to do with IT, I think it was really effective. So people are beginning to suspect some of the phishing emails they receive. They're beginning to expect some of the crazy pop-ups that appear on their screen. So if it's on the computer screen in front of you, you're suspicious. If it's in a car park and it's a bit of paper left there for you, you're not suspicious. So I think that's where social engineering is going. Uh, it's open to such creativity now. The more creative your attack, the more likely it is to succeed. And of course, you can get so creative now, you can find so much information because of social networks. I mean, social networking has really changed the face of social engineering over the past three or four years. So social engineers like to use social networks because it's such a huge attack surface. We've all seen the statistics on the number of users. Um, of course, it's quick and it's easy. Sometimes you can even automate it to look up uh, phone numbers that you can use in your vishing attacks, for example. It's got a low barrier entry point. You don't have to be technically leaked to do social engineering attacks via social networks. You just have to be a bit imaginative, or you just have to copy somebody else's attack. You hardly need any technical skills at all, apart from to be able to work social networks. Um, it relies on publicly available information. You know, people publish so much about them that they don't <coughs> realize can be used in a social networking attack. And what I like about it is I don't have to do so much dumpster diving anymore because the information is available online. And I hate dumpster diving. So dirty. <laughs> so, you know, I've loads of examples of uh, people publishing their information. This person lost their phone and they asked all their friends to send their telephone numbers through. So they all did, and they all shared their friends' telephone numbers as well. There's tons of examples like this. And uh, social engineering via social networks works because social networks are based on trust. And that's exactly what social engineers like to exploit. Uh, it's really easy to impersonate somebody on social networks. This example of impersonation in the real world took place in London. Some guys dressed up as policemen went into a data center in the middle of London and said, uh, we've had reports of people on your roof. We need to go in and investigate. So they went into the data center. Because they were dressed as policemen, they had handcuffs. They handcuffed the security guards to their chairs, and they walked out carrying the servers. But to execute an attack like this takes money. You need to, well, first of all, you're probably from a gang. You work in groups. You don't go in on your own. Um, you need to procure co the costumes somehow. You need to get your policeman costumes. So either you need to purchase them, or you need to get them illegally. Um, there's the potential for physically harming people. I mean, they had to uh, handcuff 
the staff to the chairs. As far as I know, nobody was hurt, but one person did have to be treated for shock. But this takes a lot of planning. And of course, when you're doing a physical attack like this, it's much easier to get caught. You compare this to setting up a fake profile online. It's so much easier. Social, engine, social networks are fantastic for performing your research and your reconnaissance. So once you've identified who you're going to social engineer, whether it's a particular person or a particular organization, you're going to try and gather as much information as you can about them. And I will always start with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is superb for social engineers. Uh, first of all, you can start by building an organization chart of the company you're trying to get into. You're going to establish who reports into who, who's the head of which department. You go through it and you identify the names of individuals working in there. You can target them. You could pretend to be them. Or you could name drop their names. Like if you know the name of the CEO, if you know the CEO is on holiday, because maybe he's posted it on that little TripIt plugin for LinkedIn, you go in while he's out of the office and say, well, he wanted me to do this work or he's away in Spain and he needs this document, please send it to me so I can get it to him. It gives you so much information. Of course, you can set up a fake profile and link into your target. It's pretty easy to imagine who should know who in any particular industry. Um, if people are friends on Facebook, if John and Jane are friends on Facebook and Jane doesn't appear to have a LinkedIn account, set one up under her name and then send John a LinkedIn request probably going to believe it. Um, lots of people accept LinkedIn requests from whoever sends them to them anyway. So you may not even have to set up a fake profile. And of course, we receive LinkedIn requests nearly every day. You know exactly what that email looks like. Spoof it. So once you got the name of individuals who work for your target organization on LinkedIn, Look them up on other social networking sites. See what they have in their Facebook accounts, their MySpace accounts. Do more tactical research on that person. Here's an example. You know these surveys that people fill in and like to publish online. They like to give away their dates of birth. They like to give away their home addresses and more. So uh, this guy, Bob, I noticed that his perfect pizza is the Domino's Meat Feast pizza. So I thought about how you could use this in a social engineering attack. It's very similar to one I did do in a company. So you know what company Bob works for, and you know what city he works in. They have several branches in the city, so you call around to each branch until you identify which one he works in. Then you buy your Domino's delivery shirt. They're really cheap on eBay. You can get four for $9.99, Buy it now. So share them with your friends. So you got your delivery shirts, order the meat feast pizza from Domino's, collect it, go somewhere else, put on your delivery shirt, and bring the pizza to Bob's office. If he objects and says he didn't order it, tell him one of his friends did. You got the names of all his friends from his Facebook account. So you're in the office, plug in a wireless access point, plug in a keylogger, actually physically take the information away. If you think this is too risky, how about you email Bob a voucher for a free pizza? Maybe his birthday is coming up next week. Hi Bob, thanks for being such a loyal customer for Domino's Pizza. We'd like to offer you the next one on the house. Print the attached voucher. This hasn't come out so well. This is another guy, Joe. And Joe was really, really uh, useful to us. Not only did he publish all the information about where he worked, where he was born, what school he went to. You probably can't make it out, but he actually says what his income is as well. So from attackers, an attacker's point of view, you know exactly how much you can take this guy for. So uh, he's a couple of things on his survey that caught my eye. Uh, his goal this year is to give up smoking. His deepest fear is creepy crawlies. And again, he's got a favorite pizza in there. So how could you social engineer this guy? Well, a couple of ideas. He's got 45 friends on this MySpace page. 
you know when his birthday is. Uh, there's lots of birthday cards now that come with CDs in them. So send him a birthday card on behalf of one of his friends with a CD or a USB key in it that has dancing, supposedly has dancing ladies or something like that in it, but obviously it goes on to compromise his machine. Send him a stop smoking pack, again with some kind of media that he needs to plug in, or maybe even, even a link to a site he should visit. Or finally, you can threaten him with creepy crawlies until he gives you the information that you want. Uh, the last speaker spoke about blippy.com, fantastic resource again <laughs> for social engineers. Um, so you can register your credit card accounts to blippy, you can register your online purchasing accounts like eBay or iTunes or Netflix to blippy, and every time you make a purchase, it appears. Uh, so apart from people knowing exactly how much you paid for their gifts, or how much you paid for the bottle of wine that you've just brought to the party. It, it can be <laughs> really useful for social engineers. So take this example. This guy just rented a couple of movies at Netflix. He rented two Spartacus movies. So email him or call him. Say you're calling from Netflix. How did he like the Spartacus movies? Again, offer him the next one free of charge. We'd like to send you the third Spartacus movie. What's your email address? I'll send you a voucher. Foursquare.com, any kind of geotagging uh, social networking site is useful not only for social engineers, but for burglars. And I'm sure you've all seen the Please Rob Me project that was set up earlier this year and uh, noted the locations of people and therefore when their houses were likely to be empty. Here's an example. So you take this first guy. Uh, he left home and he's going to this lovely Irish pub in Paris. So if you're after this guy, go to the pub. He's got his photo there. You know what he looks like. Strike up a conversation with him. Steal his bag. While he's out, rob his house. Break in. He's probably got loads of work stuff in there. There's so many things you can do once you have this information. So social networks are great, but there's loads and loads of technology now that you can use to uh, improve or automate your social engineering attacks to make them more effective or to, to make them more fun from a social engineer's point of view as well. So you've got Photoshop or GIMP. You can make your own ID cards. You can make your own business cards. Actually, there's loads of websites that you can use online to, uh, to produce ID cards and business cards as well. So that's not a problem. Uh, you can use Multigo or People to do some passive reconnaissance. So you've got the name of an entity, whether it's an organization or an individual. Multigo will give you a really good graphical representation of links between that entity and other entities. So you put in the name of an individual. It may come back with email addresses, physical addresses, telephone numbers, etc. It's really useful. Uh, social Engineers Toolkit from socialengineer.org. Again, it's fantastic for social engineers. It's a one-stop social engineering shop. It's really, really good for running any particular phishing program, for example. It can recreate entire websites. It can automate sending the payload out via a phishing email. It's really good. And of course, there's so many other things like physical bugs that you can put into rooms. They're so much slicker now than they used to be. I've got a, a handbag with a secret hidden camera in it that I bring around. I can use it for shoulder surfing people while they're typing in their passwords. <coughs> or I can use it for recording an entire social engineering attack. Um, and of course, you got caller ID spoofing, which anybody could do these days. You just buy an application to do it. You can buy a spoof card, or you can buy an application for your smartphone. And spoof card is often the number one seller on sites like Spy Associates. So it's really easy to do. I feel like James Bond sometimes when I'm doing my social engineering attacks because I have so much cool equipment. I really like this one. It's, it's a memory card inside a coin. So sometimes when you go into data centers, you have to hand over all your media and your mobile phone, uh, everything like that. But they're hardly going to check every single coin you have in your pocket. You do have to be careful not to spend it. <laughs> but what about, uh, what about the technology and the equipment that we might expect to see in future. 
a couple of weeks ago, scientists made another development uh, with regards to invisibility cloaks, so very Harry Potter style. Can you imagine if you had an invisibility cloak and you're trying to get into an organization? Be brilliant. <laughs> Last week, this hit the news. There's a laser camera that takes photos around corners. What fantastic technology. So the whole idea of this laser camera, this is a quote from one of the guys that invented it, is you could generate a map before you go into a dangerous place like a burning building, for example. Or if you got a robotic car, you could compute which road it should take before you even turn the corner. So it does have some pretty good uses. I saw it and I thought, how fantastic would that be from, for shoulder surfing from afar? So this is where we are. We're the purple blob just here. Uh, the red blobs are banks nearby, presumably with ATMs. So here's one. How about you put one just about there? You put a laser camera around the corner from each of these ATMs. You're not even near the ATM and you can get people's pins. Few complications at the moment. Uh, the laser cameras are about the size of a room, so it's a little tricky. <laughs> and the picture quality is pretty poor for the moment. Can you imagine in future how useful that would be? So finally, uh, with social engineering, if you don't want to do it yourself, you can outsource it now. They set up call centers all over the place that will do your social engineering for you. So uh, they will provide you with professional callers, male and female, any language, any age that you want. Um, and it's approximately seven to fifteen dollars per call. So the whole idea behind this is obviously um, it's really easy to buy credit cards online, but getting a credit card, what you do with it, it's not actually that useful. What you want to do with it is buy valuable equ equipment or valuable things online and then sell them. So you've paid two dollars for your credit card you want to buy a laptop online, maybe the latest Mac, but you want to sell it for $500, everyone's getting a good deal, you make quite a healthy profit out of it. But the problem is the credit card is registered to a 77-year-old Italian lady, and you need to call up the bank to change the delivery address and to change the billing address. Well, chances are, I don't see anybody in here that looks like a, or sounds like a 77-year-old Italian lady. Um, so what do you do? You get one of these call centers onto the case. They got some pretty slick ordering screens now where you provide the type of order, uh, what age group, what you would like the person to sound like, and you pay seven to fifteen dollars per call. So this particular professional call service example um, will take calls for twelve dollars. Uh, they'll only accept money for full calls and if an operation fails because of insufficient data provided by the customer, we hold no responsibility. For example, a question about the cardholder's neighbours, as we don't have this info. So it's, again, it's uh, encouraging you to research more and more about your target so that you can increase the chances of this call being successful. Uh, scareware has been a huge issue over the past year in particular. We often see the pop-up saying, would you like a free antivirus check of your PC? Um, but lately, what we're seeing in the UK is people are receiving telephone calls saying, uh, we've noticed, this is Microsoft, for example, we've noticed that you've got a virus on your computer. Would you like to outsource the management of your computer to us? We'll keep it safe. You just have to pay a small monthly fee. And of course, you give across uh, all your user credentials as well as paying them a monthly fee. But they reckon that this is all happening via call centers as well. So if you don't want to social engineer directly, just outsource it. Uh, so that's about it for me on uh, the future of social engineering. It's always going to be the same tricks repeated again and again with different technology. It's become a lot more sophisticated and a lot more targeted uh, frequently because of social networking which has provided us with a whole new attack surface and so much more information about our potential targets. There's more and more technology that will help you to improve or automate your social engineering attacks. And now we've got social engineering as a service. Of course, for me, that means that social engineering has become an even bigger problem lately. 
and there's going to be a lot more social engineering testing. So uh, that's it for me. If you've got any questions, I think I have a couple of minutes I can take them. OK, great. Please speak up. OK. I just keep wondering how many of you nice girls out there do social engineering here. <laughs> so. Uh, Oh, what about you guys? <laughs> <Are> you <laughs> yes. What about you guys here? How many of you uh, were sent here by a service uh, for social engineering? Anyone? Speak up. I mean, it's, it's safe with us, you know? And people use social engineering all the time. Kids are fantastic social engineers. <laughs> Uh, I'm likely to ask, so how many times have you sold the Eiffel Tower now? Uh, well, I'll give you a good deal, Sven, if you're looking to buy it. <laughs> okay, I'm considering it. Can I just ask you to, uh, it's for the recording. What's been your best social engineering attack so far that you've done yourself, or the most fun? Uh, well, I really like the physical social engineering attacks when you actually physically have to break into an office or a data center uh, because you get such an adrenaline rush while you're doing them. Uh, I'm a pen tester as well, and you know when you penetrate a system online or you get into a web application, you get a bit of a buzz, but it's nothing like social engineering. When you have people after you in the office, you're in somewhere, the security guards could be right there. They may know you're in there. So you get such a buzz, and I think, uh, one of the most fun ones I did um, was wh when you go into a place and you try and social engineer it, the first time you do it, you're really quite nervous. You got all the adrenaline. But you come in, you, d you, you social engineer it, you go out again, and you think, I saw five more ways I could get that organization. And you get really quite confident. You get a little bit cocky. <laughs> so I was in one place, and um, they were recruiting t uh, temporary workers for an, for an event that they were throwing that weekend. So the reception was very busy because people were filling in application forms. So I just went and I sat in there and I had my laptop with me. And uh, I saw that there was loads of network points around the room. And I plugged my laptop into several of them. And they were dead. There was about three security guards and a reception desk in this room. But it was quite busy, so fair enough, they didn't see me. But they had a computer where they registered everybody coming into the organization. And uh, that was just out in the middle of the floor, and it was obviously plugged into the network. So I thought, well, that's obviously live. If I could plug my laptop in there, it would be pretty useful. So I went straight up to a security guard, and I said, do you mind if I check my email just there? It'll only be a second. just need to take the network cable out for about two minutes. And he says, yeah, yeah, no problem at all. And he brought me over a chair <laughs> to sit on. <laughs> so I really liked that. <laughs> I think... Um, for remote attacks, uh, I was quite proud of an attack I did where I found um, on the company website that they'd had some people who entered a charity marathon the previous week, and they had done quite well. So I spoofed an email that looked like it came from the marathon organizers, and I said, congratulations to uh, Joe and John, who came eighth and ninth in the marathon. If you want to see where you came, please click on the attachments. So I was pretty successful, because it was targeted. to get, jet out, uh, get out of jail free cards before you go on Every the single time, even if it's just a remote attack, yeah. And how do you mitigate against causing any damage? So, for example, plugging your laptop into the uh, network point and then launching whatever attack you're thinking yeah. of doing, how do you, uh, do you have to be careful about not stopping any business services or? Oh, yeah, we do. Um, to be as careful as possible. But once I, uh, I was in an office and I sat in a team meeting with six people, I was in the room with them, and people hate to confront you. So no one asked me what I was doing there. So they were having their meeting, and again, I took the network cable out of one of their computers. Oh, actually, 
Um, I'm not sure what service it was used for, but halfway during the meeting, this guy goes, oh, I don't have internet access anymore. I said, I'm really sorry. I think I've taken your network cable, but here you go. And he didn't care at all. <laughs> but you do have to be careful. And, um, you know, we have really tight statements of work that outline exactly what we're going to do and what the client wants us to target or what kind of trophies we're to gather. So sometimes they don't even want you to plug into the network. Sometimes it might be a case of leaving some evidence in there, like a sticker saying Sharon was here on a certain date. Sometimes they want you to plug in and simply get an IP address to prove you've been in there. Or more often than not, it's just a, qu a question of sniffing some network traffic for 10 minutes, just as a proof concept more than anything. After that, it's the same risks as any internal pen test. Did you ever get caught and went to jail? <laughs> Touch wood. Uh, no, I haven't been caught. It's been close once or twice. Um, on one particular occasion, the people in the organization had been warned in advance that we were going to be doing some social engineering tests, which we would often tell people not to do because if your staff are warned in advance, it's not a realistic test of how successful a real social engineer would be. Um, so I got to this organization and uh, I made up my excuse for being in there. And they said, that's okay, but first of all, you have to go and sit in the security room with the head of security, because we're checking everybody who comes in this week. So I went in, I sat with this guy, and he says, I'm really sorry we have to do this, but we're having something this week called social engineering tests. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and he explained to me what social engineering was, and I said, people really do that? <laughs> he said, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I got out. And another time it was pretty close was when I, uh, my early days of social engineering, I decided I'd pretend to be a fire warden from the local council. Um, so I went in with my clipboard, because sometimes the local councils do do spot checks to make sure you've got all your fire equipment in place. So I went in and I had the document printed off that the council would usually have, because it was on their website. And I went through it, went into the office, went through it, ticked everything off, and I asked them, did they have this policy? And they said, we do, but we can't find it now. So after I was gone, they decided to ring the local council to say they had got the policy, where is Sharon, because they'd like to send it in. And that's when I found out that impersonating public officials is illegal. <laughs> but don't do that anymore. <laughs> yes, I guess we have uh, time for just one more question. So just before the break, anyone? Question. Um, how often do you do combination attacks, so pen testing and uh, social engineering combined, either simultaneously or to complement each other? Yeah, um, pretty frequently. I mean, that's the ideal <coughs> test that we would like to do because it shows what any malicious attacker or man in the street might be able to do. So it's the most realistic. Um, there may be one, one in four tests that would be a full all-out attack. The rest of them would just be restricted to getting an IP address or sniffing some network traffic or something like that. The remote ones are often the full attack, so once you, uh, you push somebody and get their credentials, then you do a full pen test with that, with that as well. Okay. All right, I guess <clears throat> it's time for the break. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thanks, everyone.